Welcome to the Paul Lawrence Dunbar Historic Site. We're about to go inside, but before we do so, take a quick look at the neighborhood. This area is like a lot of neighborhoods. It's faced challenges. During the 19th century, at the turn of the 20th, it was a very different neighborhood. This was a working class neighborhood. There were some professionals inside the area, doctors, lawyers, a couple of physicians, things like that, but it was primarily a working class neighborhood. Just to our northeast was the West Side Colony. That was Hungarian residents brought in to work at Dayton Malleable Iron, which is, was very nearby. On the other hand, this was an area close to downtown. There was very little in the way of empty land. One of the things that made this site unique is the fact that the lot included the side lot to our south. This was vacant land. It was included in part of the purchase price when Paul bought the property for his mother in 1903. We're standing in the formal parlor. This was a place where the family could show off their position, state to the world that they had arrived. All of the furnishings in the room are from the family, with the exception of the violin. It is similar to the one that Paul actually had, and he did play. This was a place where very special guests could be entertained, separate from the rest of the house. But again, it's a place where Paul or his mother could basically announce to the world that they had arrived. The fact that Paul was able to purchase the house speaks to his help by benefactors. It speaks to his audience purchasing his work and his ability to gain a mortgage. This was unique at the turn of the 19th century. We're standing in the dining room. This is probably the room that saw more activity than the formal parlor did. This is where special guests could be entertained. People like James Weldon Johnson, when he came to town, would be entertained here in the, in the dining room. All of the furnishings are from the time period, with the exception of the bench across the, the room, which was owned by Matilda, something that she had when she was in Kentucky. Both Mil uh, Matilda and Paul's father, Joshua, had been born as slaves in Kentucky. Matilda had thought about escaping on the Underground Railroad and for a variety of reasons chose not to. Jos Joshua did. He escaped into Canada and came back to serve in two black regiments out of Massachusetts. Both had been former slaves and they tried to pass on to their son some of their experiences. Matilda tried to put an optimistic slant toward things. Her stories always were more rosy, and that was reflected in some of Paul's work, like his poem, The Party, where all of the slaves were happy and there was plenty of food. Both Matilda and Joshua had very strong personalities. They separated when Paul was still quite young. Joshua established his home in the soldier's home out in what is now the VA and Paul would occasionally go out to visit. Joshua told stories of his life, particularly in the Civil War, but he did not believe in, in sheltering his son from the harsh realities of life. His stories were much more realistic, and that too was reflected in Paul's work. Here in the kitchen, you can see some of the personal touches that turn a house into a home. Things like Mother Dunbar's mixing bowl, her apple peeler, you can also see some of the modern conveniences that were incorporated into the house to make life a little easier for these two. Things like a, a gas stove that included a hot water heater. Things like the telephone. Only about 10% of Dayton residents had a phone in 1903, 1904. So this was a luxury. And it's one of the things that was incorporated into the house when Paul purchased the property. We're standing on the back porch. This was originally a back porch. It was enclosed by the time that Paul purchased the property for his mother. You can see some of the modern conveniences that were incorporated into the house that made it more appealing to them. Things like the indoor water pump, an ice box that they acquired. You can also see things that give hints of their life. Things like the traveling trunk, similar to one, one that Mother Dunbar used to visit Paul in Washington, D.C. and New York City in Denver. 
Here on the second floor, you can begin to see the more private lives of Paul and his mother. Here in the bathroom, you can see some of the modern conveniences that were incorporated into the house. Things like the water heater, which meant they no longer had to lug hot water up from the stove downstairs. There's an indoor toilet. That was unusual at this time. In the 1913 flood, some 4,000 privies or outhouses in the city of Dayton were flooded. This house didn't have that problem. Paul was raised by his mother, primarily as a single parent. Matilda did all kinds of odd jobs, whatever it took to bring money in. She worked as a laundress. She took in cleaning. She took in sewing. She did all kinds of odd jobs. Now that Paul has achieved success, purchased this house from her, for her, she no longer has to do that. Sewing may now be a pastime. And you see personal touches, things like her sewing basket. You'll see pictures, knickknacks, the sort of things that we all acquire, that have meaning for us, but not necessarily for others. These are the things that make the house the home. This was Matilda's bedroom. And again, you can see the personal touches that had relevance for her, including a photograph of the floral blanket that draped Paul's casket upon his death in 1906. The room seems spartan by our standards. There are no indoor walk-in closets. There are no electric lights. Light was provided by the windows and by gas fixtures throughout portions of the house. This was typical of 1903. We're standing in Paul's bedroom. This was a place where he could rest, where he could relax. When his health permitted, he could work. Uh, you also see some of the things that he acquired on his various trips, things like his traveling trunk, his hat box, his cane on the chair. When he died in 1906, his mother closed this room and his study off. They were set aside, kind of as monuments to Paul and to his work. And so these room, rooms are basically untouched. All of the furnishings are from Paul and his mother, with the exception of the rug and the bedding. This was Paul's study, in some ways the most important room in the house. This was a place where he could work when his health provided. You see, his stock and trade was books. Only a small portion of his collection is in the room today. The rest is in Columbus with the Ohio History, History Connection. Paul read voraciously. He read from a very early age on. He read of heroes, of bravery. And as he grew, he began to realize that those traits were exhibited by people around him all the time. And he tried to capture those things in his writing. Paul ended up doing a lot of dialect poetry. That's what seemed to sell. But he wrote in all the forms that literature offered. He wrote over 600 poems. He published 14 volumes of poetry. He wrote and published four novels. He wrote and published several volumes of short stories. He wrote essays. He wrote orations. He wrote hundreds of newspaper articles for papers all across the country. He also wrote the lyrics for several Broadway musicals. He changed life in this country. This was a time when the Supreme Court was establishing the policy of separate but equal. And Paul was able to break through those boundaries and establish a readership on a much broader level. This is the family room back on the first floor. It's a place to reflect on Paul and his legacy. This is where he died on February 9th, 1906. The day bed from upstairs had been brought down because he could no longer go up and down the stairs. At the time of his death, he was surrounded by his mother and very close friends. But his legacy continues. On his death, James Whitcomb Riley, the poet out of Indiana, sent a floral blanket to drape his casket. Paul set the foundations for the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 30s, probably the greatest single explosion of cultural talent that the country has ever seen. His legacy continues. Maya Angelou, and when she published her first autobiographical memoir, titled it, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, 
and that's a line from Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem, Sympathy. When asked why she chose that title, she said because it reflected the struggles that she and all others have had to face to gain acceptance, to gain an audience. But she said she also wanted to recognize the foundations upon of black literature set by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. His story continues in places that you might not normally suspect. One of the places where his work has gained increasing attention is the People's Republic of China. Since 1976, during the modernization the country has undergone, there have been increasing numbers of classes taught in universities focused on Dunbar and his work. Not always read or translated accurately, but he is gaining attention. And part of that is because he addresses all forms of inequity, social, economic, political. He speaks to all who have dreams unfulfilled. Once the house is open again after COVID, I encourage you to come and explore for yourself to see the legacy of Paul Lawrence Dunbar here in Dayton, Ohio.